I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape 5 on Friday, Vaping New Science and Advocacy Report for the 2nd of April, 2021, a.k.a. the day after April Fool's, a.k.a. the day after New York legalized recreational marijuana and expunged all the previous convictions for weed. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is perfectly legal for you to get high in New York, but it is illegal for you to go and buy flavored nicotine to stay away from deadly combustible tobacco. And no, this is not an April Fool's joke, but the state of New York, in my opinion, is a fool because the cartoon depicting the police officer pulling somebody over and saying, hey man, I hope that's cannabis in your atomizer because if it's a legal strawberry flavor, you're in trouble and you're going to go to jail. Yeah, well, that has finally come to reality. Vaping is better than smoking. Let's move on. Despite the war on tobacco harm reduction products and the consequences of the PACT Act becoming law, Safety and Health magazine published an article on April Fool's Day saying, the CDC has discovered vaping among U.S. workers is up slightly. And naturally, they're using outdated information from 2018, 2018, which doesn't take into account the Avali scare, nor does it take into account the effects from the COVID world pandemic. But hey, they still need to keep the ball rolling on their misinformation campaign, fostering even more ridiculous laws based on falsehoods and outdated information. Whoops. Why can't somebody just take responsibility for the youth vaping epidemic at its source? You know, if kids skip school, parents are held responsible for their kids' actions, right? Yes. If the school district let kids bully other kids, then the school district is held responsible, right? Yes. So why aren't parents of kids who vape in school districts where the kids are vaping being held responsible and doing what they got to do to stop the behavior that's already illegal. Someone please answer that question for me. Well, there is a glimmer of hope at one school district because someone decided to combine a sensitive smoke detector with an Alexa-like interface, and it's called Halo. And one school district in St. Joseph, Missouri, is installing the system in areas where kids are prone to illegally smoke, illegally use drugs, and illegally vape. You know, in my day, smoking in the boys' room was considered cool. It was even bolstered on rock song in the radio. Now, we have a school district taking part of a pilot program to stop these kids' activities at the source. Yes, finally! Enforce the laws we already have instead of punishing adults and preventing adults from making informed choices for themselves. Well, that's not what Parma City Council chose to do. In my 200 subscriber vlog, I went to Cleveland, Ohio and visited a couple of vape shops. And I even thought about going back to visit more of them. Yes. Well... Parma City Council says there's too many vape shops already, so they limited the vape shops. From this day forward, no more vape shops, because they're only allowed to have one vape shop per 10,000 residents. And this is all being done in the name of public health. How about new? More like the health of existing big businesses, like Planet of the Vapes. Whoops. Planet of the Vapes, even though you're over the limit, according to the thing... Um, you're still allowed, because we grandfathered you in. Don't worry. You don't have to close shop. Anyone else? Go find another specialty item if you want to open up a store in Parma. Parma, Ohio. Ah! Damn politicians. Can't leave well enough alone. Nope. You know, just like in Alabama. Shut up! Bipartisan House Bill 273 introduced at the end of February? Yeah. Well, that's not been voted on and moved to the Senate. And if you want to sell ends or alternative nicotine products in Alabama, regardless if you're the manufacturer or the distributor or the wholesaler or an actual retail establishment or somebody that's selling vape gear or alternative nicotine products online, but your customer lives in Alabama, 
Or if you want to barter with somebody that lives in Alabama, you know, trade or give away one of your items for one of their items. Wow! Yeah, well, you better pay attention. Because this law is going to apply to you. How about new? Yeah. Even if you have a relative in Alabama and you want to give them a vape for their birthday, you better comply with this law. How about new? Oh, and they even made a responsible vendor program. You know, just to make sure that every vendor is properly encouraged to train their employees in legal and responsible sales practices. It's a trap. Yep. But what makes this worse, and this isn't law yet, this has to move through the Senate and then get signed off by the governor. How about new? But what makes this worse if this language isn't changed? Because everybody's like, oh, well, this sounds measured and reasonable. Looking at what the news report says, till you actually read the 30 page bill. How about new? And you dig into it and play a little devil's advocate. You come to find out that, you know, if you're a convenience store or a computer repair shop and less than 20% of your floor space or 35% of your sales goes to selling these products, well, then the law doesn't apply to you. But if you're a vape shop, a specialty store that can teach people how to properly use these devices, well, then you, you need to follow all aspects of this law. Aww. Yeah. And you better be willing to cough up the um, $2,000 fee. Excuse me? The initial fee. And then another $500 every year. Bullshit! So that, you know, the state can keep an updated red tape riddled bureaucratic directory of legal and compliant vendors and manufacturers and distributors of tobacco products. And this is going to be managed by the Alcohol Beverage Control Board of Alabama. Yeah. In conjunction with local, county, state, and federal agencies. Alrighty then. Yeah. And this is all so that people under the age of 21 don't have access to tobacco products. Because, you know, there's already a federal statute that makes it illegal, so we need to go and change all, our, all of our laws. Okay. If the only thing you changed was the age, you know, compliance requirement to 21, there wouldn't be any question about it. But it's interesting, because when you look into it and you dig into this bill, I found something very interesting. Yeah. The board may use funding from grants. Okay, the Department of Health. Okay, from other state and federal agencies. Okay, sounds reasonable. And here's the part that really gets me. As well as private and public organizations. Wait a minute. Why does private and public organizations, why do they have anything to do with enforcement of this law? That doesn't make any sense. Bloomberg, you sly bastard. You found a state willing to happily take your money and crafted this legislation to allow you to spend more of your money in Alabama. Yeah. Moving on to Canada. Get fucked. In British Columbia, Canada, the MLAs, the MPs, and the prime minister they needed a pay raise. Because, you know, the six-figure income for being a politician, well, that's not enough. So, what are they going to do? Well, if you live in British Columbia, guess what? Effective April 1st, you could now welcome the 7% provincial sales tax. Leave me alone. And the new British Columbia carbon tax rate of 9.9 .9 cents per liter of gasoline. Leave me alone. And 12.6. 12 cents per liter of diesel. Shut up! And 8.8 .8 cents per cubic meter of natural gas. Shut up, dummy. And if you think the food or digital products are exempt from this provincial tax, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Pepsi and Netflix are now taxed in British Columbia. How about new? Because that's what the taxpayers needed after the pandemic shutdown. You know, today's rage has dragged on this opening summary just way too long. We're running out of time. So I'm going to give you the short and sweet summary for the rest of it. 
Stick around. All right. Yes. Indonesia needs e-cigarettes to be labeled differently than tobacco. Yeah. Vaping prohibitionists threaten harm reduction efforts. There's another obvious title. Least obvious to me. UK Parliament is jousting with the World Health Organization's anti-vaping stance. Yep. Bans and prohibition. Yeah, well, they don't change teen vaping habits because it was already banned in certain aspects in certain places like Hong Kong. Well, we got an article that takes and looks at what happens after you ban something. And does it really change the behavior of teens? Well, that's an easy choice for us. I'll leave the big surprise for later. I've also got a job application for a postdoctoral researcher with expertise in analytical chemistry and vaping. And lastly, I've got a National Institute of Health Eureka alert. Yeah, it says that 60% of you vapors want to quit. <laughs> Shut up! What the? Shut the hell up! Ain't nothing to it, but to get into it. Stupid is, stupid does, sir. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, here's the first article for today. And it's just... Unbelievable is what I can say. That's the best I can say is unbelievable. Okay. We already know vape mail bans taken into effect. And despite what everybody originally thought, this affects more than just the people living in the United States. Because see, when this first was put into law, everybody was like, oh, well, you know, you won't be able to ship it through the post office. No big deal. And then UPS jumped on board, and then FedEx jumped on board. DHL jumped on board. And it's not so much they jumped on board, but see, these companies realized that the primary crux of this whole vape mail ban is the fact that all ENDS products and vaporizers and anything that could potentially administer nicotine that isn't approved by the FDA as a smoking cessation tool well, it's now classified as tobacco. And this isn't something new. I mean, UPS, FedEx, DHL, they already had policies about tobacco. They don't want to have anything to do with it because they don't want to be caught up in the legal compliance requirements. I mean, dealing with the ATF, you don't, you don't want to go to jail. You don't want somebody busting down your door because you forgot to fill out some stupid paperwork or there was some law passed in some ridiculous little area that you had no clue about. That's why I dug so far into Alabama's law. Because it's just, man, trying to follow the law, you would think would be very simple. Well, not so much. It's a trap. So, here we are today. Post-vape apocalypse. Vape mail ban. And I'm going to leave a link in the description. I'm not going to cover this because I've already covered this last couple of weeks in a row and everybody already knows this and everybody's kind of sick and tired of it. Quite honestly. But one aspect of it that hasn't been talked about yet that I think needs to be covered is the fact that, you know, when this first went into law, I was kind of wondering, you know, how come we didn't hear a whole lot about these vape shops? And I know some of them were just scrambling to be able to find vendors because they do a good percentage of their sales online. So I'm thinking, okay, well, what's the uh, stores actually think about this? The big stores, you know, the stores that buy things from wholesalers and distributors, big wholesalers and big distributors, or the ones that are large enough that, you know, they can go directly to the manufacturer and buy things by the multitudes, the pallets and the cases, what do they think about it? Because, you know, they're going to distribute it amongst their many stores that they have. Well, what do they think about it? Well, take a look at this article. Hello. It says they're quite happy about it. Matter of fact, they're grateful. 
because with all these online stores closing, well, they'll be able to have a lot more business. And if you take a look at this article, there's 10,000 vape shops in the U.S. and an estimated 8 million users. I'd be willing to bet that there's a lot more than 10,000 vape shops. Or there were at one point in time. Whoops. However, I thought it was interesting that um, these people just bought Wiki Vapes. Hmm. And they were devastated because of the shutdowns and lockdowns for COVID. But they seem to be doing pretty good now. Yeah. I'll let you read the actual article yourself. I've been fuming since I started doing the research for this yesterday. And it's just, it's also because I order, I pack it, I placed an order from Element Vape and this is something that I thought about ordering beforehand, but I kind of put it off and said, well, I got other things I want to order first, make sure I get those. And then when those things didn't pan out, then I says, okay, well, I still got a little bit of budget left here for something. What is it that I really want that I, I've been dying to have? So let's go find it. So I placed an order for Element Vape. Yeah, I loved it. It was great. Bend over and take one up the All because, well, Pennsylvania needs to have its 40% tax. Yeah. In addition to the sales tax that you have to pay, that had to be collected too. Oh, and now there's an extra $5 surcharge to make sure that it actually get the signature. Because, you know, anytime we've already had registered mail sent here, and during the days of COVID, the mailman just goes, it's all right, I'll, I'll scribble your name. Not anymore, because now they have to document your government-issued ID as part of your sales transaction. You want to destroy our business? Yeah, so that's an extra $5 charge. Nice. I placed a $100 order. Cost me an extra 50 bucks from what would have cost a week ago to order the same thing. Exact same thing for the exact same prices. Cost me an extra fifty dollars now. Thank you. Love it. Well, Safety and Health published an article saying that uh, vaping rates among U.S. workers is up slightly. Do they have nothing else to write about? Whoops. Because they're using data from 2017 and 2018. You know how much has happened since 2018? Nope. Regarding vaping? Nope. And the numbers of people that vape? <laughs> There'll be a link in the description below. I just want good news. But here's a little bit of good news. Somebody actually came up with a system that's going to catch these kids and punish them and prevent them from actually being able to get away with what they've been doing. I figure personally, if they have the system instituted and implemented in every single school district all across the country, well, then there won't be a youth vaping epidemic, right? Yeah. Not so much. When they cracked down on smoking when I was in high school, you know what happened? Nope. They went outside. <laughs> and they skipped school to do what they wanted to do. Because that's what kids do. Whoops. But at least now the school district can cover their ass and say, well, they weren't vaping in our school. They weren't doing drugs in our school. <laughs> but everything comes at a cost, even for them. And you know how much this system is? Nope. $200,000. Yeah. Just basically to put up a couple Alexa-powered, you know, smoke detectors in all the places where kids hide and sneak away to to go do their thing. Yeah. So this school is part of the pilot program, and uh, they're going to crack down on vaping, and this might shut it all down. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me tell you something. When kids want to do something, kids are going to do something, and they don't care about any laws. They don't care about any of this. You put countermeasures into place, they'll find workarounds. There's always a workaround available to them. Yep, there's always a workaround. So I came across an article, and uh, this was pretty interesting. I, like I said, I went back to uh, Cleveland, Ohio for my uh, 50th birthday. Went vape store hopping. And uh, 
I was impressed by the number of vape stores in the Cleveland area. I mean, in some parts, at least on the west side of Cleveland. I mean, you get on Lorraine Road and you just start driving. At least every couple of blocks, you'd find another vape store and a little vape shop. I'm like, this is pretty cool. Especially because they don't have any of this ridiculous wholesale taxing in Cleveland. So, well, I'll just go there and buy my stuff. Instead of having to worry about all this other shit. Well, pharmacies, no more vape stores. We got too many vape stores. We need to stop all these vape stores. Because, you know, business isn't going to regulate itself. If people are making money on it, we got to stop them from making money. Yeah, well, they imposed this brand new statute. So if you live in Parma, Ohio, no more vape stores. And until a couple of them close, because some of them are grandfathered in, until the number of vape stops drop below one vape shop per 10,000 residents in the city, well, don't expect to see any new ones. But that's not going to stop people from opening them up at your border in the neighboring towns. So if you live in Strongsville or Middleburg Heights or any of these other areas, hey, don't worry, man. Parma is losing out on the business income and the licensing fees that they could have gotten by letting businesses open up whatever kind of business they want to open up. But they wanted to be little nannies and say... We need to limit the number of vape stores because, you know, we've got too many of them already. Sounds more like you have a big vape store that says, hey, get rid of the competition. Make it incredibly hard for anybody to want to be able to open up a store to be able to open up a store to compete with us. <laughs> kind of like the way the tobacco industry does. But I won't get into that today. Let's move on. Alabama House passes bill designed to curb teenage vaping. Boy, that's a drum that never ends. Regulate state's vape industry. Yeah. Sounds good. I don't I don't object to this. I don't object to this. I don't object to this. I'm telling you, after reading all these bills, I'm at the point now where I'm about ready to object to any bill regarding vaping. Because when you give them an inch, they'll take five miles. And the web of regulations is already so complex in some places. It's a trap. It's impossible for anybody to really expect to be able to comply with every little statute and provision in the rules and regulations. I rest my case. Alabama's kind of like the perfect example of this. Yeah. All because they said that, you know, this is going to help. Nope. To use vaping problem. Uh, Anti-vaping propaganda is brain poison. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, this is supposed to help the youth vaping problem. Among them, it would prevent vape manufacturers and retailers from using advertising techniques designed to appeal to youth people, such as incorporating characters from comic books and ad campaigns. Yeah, okay, sounds reasonable. Well, all the stuff that they, that they have listed here in this article sounds reasonable. So what did I do? Well, I want to go to the horse's mouth. I went right to the bill. I want to see the text of this bill. Because I've seen a lot of places. And you know what? Every time I've read any law that's passed in any state or any country, the title of the bill rarely encompasses everything that that new bill deals with. This bozo over here. And a lot of the times, the title of the bill is actually... I mean, quite hypocritical of what's in the content of that bill. I mean, that the premise right now all across the country is we need to take all of our laws and we need to comply with the federal statutes that say, well, the minimum age to use any tobacco product is now 21. 
So that gives them the ability to go in and make these changes. And sometimes it's because everybody thinks, oh, well, we just naturally need to make sure that our laws comply with federal laws because we don't want to be different than them. Bullshit! Well, those things, just like that, introduced one day, sent to committee, out of committee. Next week it's being on, you know, voted on by the floor, moves from the House into the Senate. Month later, these bills can become law. Except the things that are contained within them. I can't believe you've done this. They can be pretty devastating and catastrophic. Let's get this straight. Because now that the PACT Act is in law and the ATF is responsible for enforcing this stuff. I'm so scared. Well, you better pay attention because you do something illegal, you can go to jail for tax evasion. <laughs> or you can go to jail for, you know, selling a tobacco product illegally. I mean, the premise is you're not supposed to sell it to kids. Okay. Everybody agrees with that. I don't think you can find anybody that, you know, wants to argue that point at this stage of the game. I mean, I personally think that you should be able to buy it as soon as you are eligible to be eligible for the military. So if everything is now moved up to 21, then, well, you shouldn't be allowed to join the military until you can turn 21. I don't see the government doing that, though. If you're old enough to die for your country, you're old enough to make the choices that any competent adult is able to make because you're willing to give up the ultimate sacrifice of your own life for your country. But you're not old enough to make other choices. Bullshit! You, it, you can't have it both ways. Pick an age, whatever that age is, and that's the age of maturation. But that's just my opinion. Shut the hell up. That's not the point of me bringing this article up. Vaping is better than smoking. Any person who sells, barters, exchanges, or gives to any individual under the age of 21 years any tobacco product, electronic nicotine delivery system, or alternative nicotine product, on conviction, shall be fined not less than $100 nor more than $300 and may also be imprisoned in the county jail for not more than 30 days. How you doing? Nope. So you mean to tell me that there aren't parents out there that are faced with the conundrum of, hey man, I caught my kid smoking. He's getting access to it. Yeah, I can call the cops and cause a bunch of hoopla. So I am confusion. But is that going to stop my kid from smoking? Because I know firsthand, once you light up that first cigarette, you're addicted to it. So what are you supposed to do as a parent? As a responsible parent, what are you supposed to do? Well, that's a bit of a problem. You're not allowed to give them anything. Because even as their own parent, you are breaking the law by giving somebody under the age of 21 one of these products. <coughs> what are you supposed to do? They didn't think about this when they wrote this law. Alrighty then. Don't get me wrong. I agree with it. They shouldn't have it. But, but you're an asshole. it's time that vaping, these electronic nicotine delivery systems are accepted as what they are intended to be used for and stop punishing adults and forcing people to the combustible tobacco. Shut up. Let's move on. Vaping is better than smoking. This is the part of the article that I actually found really, really interesting. You know, you read through this stuff and it's like, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. Uh, I understand why they did that. Okay. Yeah. You don't want this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you don't want advertising. I get that part. I understand people that sell tobacco need to have a tobacco permit. Okay, that makes sense. 
tobacco specialty stores or businesses that at least 75% of the revenue comes from tobacco or tobacco products. Okay, I understand that classification. Um, that makes sense. Okay, you want to cover something specifically to them. All right. Okay. The board shall adopt rules and have the full force and effect of law for the purposes of the following. Establishing permits for the distribution of tobacco, tobacco products, electronic nicotine delivery systems, and alternative nicotine products. Preventing the distribution of tobacco, tobacco products, electronic nicotine delivery systems, and alternative products to individuals under the age of 21. Okay. Conducting annual random compliance checks to ensure compliance with the applicable state and federal laws and guidelines regarding the distribution of tobacco, tobacco products, electronic nicotine delivery systems, and alternative nicotine products. The tests involved any involving any person or location engaging in the distribution of tobacco may utilize individuals under the age of 21. What? So you're going to be able to use a youth to go and get these things. Okay. Okay. Well, that's what they do for tobacco. They send underage kids in to buy a pack of cigarettes. And they bust the store for selling it illegally. Okay. Aww. The board may use funding, if available, from the Department of Mental Health. How about new? Well, that's pretty shitty. You gotta leave the, 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 the mental health people with the budget they already have. Why are you taking... It's the goof of all oh. time. Move on. Other state or federal agencies, grants, and private and public organizations... And private... What the hell does private and public organizations to enforce the chapter and to provide and distribute tobacco and nicotine prevention materials to retail tobacco merchants and especially retailers of electronic nicotine delivery systems? What? What? So the board may use funding to provide and distribute nicotine prevention materials to retail tobacco merchants and specialty retailers of electronic nicotine systems. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Bloomberg? This is your weasel way into this. This is your weasel way to go spend money in Alabama. No, that's a bit of a problem. Mm-hmm. That is unbelievable, man. You get an F minus in my book. What a creep. The board may also provide consultation services for establishing programs to minimize or eliminate sales of tobacco or tobacco products, alternative nicotine products, and electronic nicotine delivery systems. Mm-hmm. To individuals under the age of 21 pursuant to the Responsible Vendor Program. Uh-huh. Pretty interesting. For those of you that have not worked at a bar that has to comply with all the liquor control laws that are out there, every bartender needs to be certified in recognizing when somebody's had too much to drink. And you need to go and take classes and you need to recertify to understand when somebody has had too much and to shut them off and send them on their way safely. Mm -hmm. They're implementing the exact same things for tobacco now. Yeah. So any employee of a vape shop, that's going to be the next thing that's going to come out of legislation once this is passed. Well, any vape shop employee now has to go and get certified. Well, yeah. They're going to have to become addiction specialists and they're going to tell, they're going to write laws. that are going to tell these employees at a vape store that you need to determine what the nicotine usage is of your customer and try to wean them off of it. Try and suggest to them that they use a pharmaceutical product. Yeah. Like patches and sprays and gum. 
How about no? And if somebody has a severe addiction problem, well, then you need to send them to their doctor. What are they going to do next? Commit somebody into the psych ward? Because they think they're a nicotine addict? Caffeine will kill you! I'm not going to go into this any further. You can take a look at the actual bill yourself. But regardless of whether you agree with my statement on this or not, or my position on this, even though some may say that I'm being very defensive. No, sir. I didn't like it. And guarded. Shut up, dummy. I highly recommend if you live in Alabama or you make any products. This will be fine, surely. Nope. You follow this very closely because there is going to be a link description in the description below for legal scan where it actually shows you the vote for this bill. And it shows you who voted for it, who didn't vote for it, who was there to vote but says, oh, I'm not going to register my vote on this bill. Uh-huh. And it's convenient because in Legal Scan, they also have a follow the money link where you can go and find out who is bribing these politicians to see things from their perspective. Pretty interesting. Check out the link in the description below. I'm moving on because I've already taken up too much time on something I have no control over. And most of you probably don't even live in the state of Alabama. Nope. How about we have another law that went into effect on April Fool's Day. This one's up in Canada. Yeah, new taxes take effect, and this is not an April Fool's joke. British Columbians are now paying more taxes as of April Fool's Day. Mm-hmm. Get fucked. And you know why they did this? This is the part that's the real kicker. I'm really getting sick of these politicians and I don't understand how other people aren't furious about what these politicians get away with. I'm at the point now where, you know, all politicians, in my opinion, should have a term limit. One term, two terms is the most. I think these suckers ought to be allowed to be in office because it's utterly ridiculous what these people do. And I think it's totally wrong for them to make a career out of being in office. MLAs in Canada are going to get an 0.8% raise, bringing their salary up to $111,912 a year. Hello! Uh -huh. And they were going to do this last year, but because of the pandemic, they kind of figured, oh, better not give ourselves a raise this year. Nope. Well, now that everybody's starting to get vaccinated and everything's starting to, you know, pick back up, well, it's time to give ourselves our pay raise. Yeah. And how are they going to pay for this pay raise? Because, you know, $112,000 a year isn't enough. Base salary of an MP is $182,600. And for ministers, is $269,800. And the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, makes $365,200. Liar! Uh-huh. Real nice. How are they going to pay for these uh, pay raises? Well, we're just going to tax more people. How are we going to tax people? Well, in British Columbia, you now have a 7% provincial sales tax. It's now being added. And no exceptions for food and drinks like you used to have. Those are now included in this new raised tax. Yeah. And we got a carbon tax that's been implemented. 9.9 .9 cents per liter of gas, 12 cents per liter of diesel, and 8.8 .8 cents per cubic meter of natural gas. Mm-hmm. They say it's about $12 on a typical pickup fill. What the hell kind of pickup are they talking about that it's only a $12 increase in taxes? My excursion has 44 gallon tank. It's going to be a lot more than 12 bucks. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Well, you think that this only applies to tangible items, you know, devices and products that are actually physical form wrong again. This applies to digital items too. The streaming tax 
that they now apply to Netflix. That 7% applies to your Netflix and Hulu and, you know, all the other subscriptions for your satellite TV and everything else is now, well, the streaming tax is going to rake in $16 million by itself. And for soft drinks that are usually considered food items and weren't apply applicable for taxes, well, that's going to raise $37 million. Uh-huh. And MPs in Ottawa are going to rake in an extra $3,200 a year. Ministers are getting an extra $4,700, and Justin Trudeau is going to get an extra $6,400. Thanks to your new taxes. Have a nice day. Here's an article that I'm going to be bringing to your attention. And this isn't because this is new news. We've talked about this before. However, I'm curious to see how long it takes for certain news stories to go to other places around the world. So I'd like to check other forums, e-cig forums, vaping forums, and such, and even other business forums to see how long it takes for information to actually get to other places. Well, here we go down in South Africa. They're just now talking about Indonesia and the uh, health warnings for electronic cigarettes should be different. This was um, talked about a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Vaping Post caught on to it the 25th of March. And they're just now posting it. Yesterday. So... I shouldn't be so hard on some of the people that don't follow the news and don't pay attention to it because there aren't that many of us out there. It's a sad reality that people are content to let the government do what the government does. And when they find out about it, they either ignore or shrug their shoulders. Or they, regardless, there aren't too many people out there that are willing to advocate for what they believe in. Nope. Some people are just totally oblivious to what's going on around them. There's three kind of people in the world. There's the kind of people that make things happen. There's the kind of people that go and watch things happen. And there's the kind of people that go, what the hell just happened? Don't ever be the third kind of person. Always be aware of what's going on around you. And if it matters to you, I highly suggest that you get involved and become active in the community. I don't care if it's as simple as writing an editorial to your local newspaper or website that you go to and follow or posting on Facebook or any of these other social media sites or making little TikTok videos. You have to stand up for what you believe in because if you don't, the world's just going to keep marching along and the people that are out there advocating are going to get what they want. They're going to get other people to give them what they want. Moving on. Here we have vaping prohibitionists threaten harm reduction efforts written by Lindsay Stroud. And I've seen her write many other uh, articles. This one's a pretty good one. April Fool's Day marks the 26th annual Take Down Tobacco National Day of Action hosted by the Nanny State Organization Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. The prohibitionist nonprofit uses the day as a signature platform for empowering people to stand up and speak out against the tobacco industry. Having its event on April Fool's is only appropriate considering the foolish science that they peddle to prevent people from using tobacco harm reduction products. Regrettably, in its mission to take down tobacco, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids is harming adult smokers who rely on tobacco harm reduction products. Indeed, in the picture on official Take Down Tobacco Day are teenagers holding signs with wording such as one pod equals one pack and fight flavored tobacco. Further in the article, CTFK blames the tobacco industry for 
peddling a wide range of addictive and dangerous products, including electronic cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, and heat not burn products. Mm -hmm. I'll let you read the rest of the article. Very well written, and it calls them out on their crap. It is utterly disgusting that policymakers still give credit to an organization that actively promotes only prohibitionist solutions to address youth vaping and scouts falsities and flat-out lies about the effectiveness of electronic cigarettes as an alternative to vaping. While Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids may be one of the many recipients of Bloomberg's billions, the United States spends $40 billion a year on Medicaid costs due to smoking-related health issues. Electronic cigarettes could help reduce those costs, and states can't afford not to listen to the real science of tobacco harm reduction products. Let's keep on vaping like our lives depend on it, because they kind of do. Take a look at the article if you want to learn more. Very well written. Moving on. From one good author to another, we've moved on to Jim McDonald's article, UK Parliamentary Inquiry Challenges World Health Organization's Anti-Vaping Stance. A parliamentary study group in the United Kingdom has called on the British government and health authorities to challenge the World Health Organization's position on vaping at an upcoming international treaty conference. The UK is the largest and most prominent country to advocate for vaping as harm reduction tool for people who smoke, but until now has not pressed the World Health Organization to change its prohibitionist stance. The recommendation came in a report by the all-party parliamentary group on vaping, issued after a four-month inquiry into the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. The FCTC is an international treaty organization with 182 member states that serves as the anti-tobacco arm of the World Health Organization. The parliamentary investigation came in response to the World Health Organization encouraging and applauding bans on vaping. How about new? The FCTC's goal and those of the World Health Organization's other tobacco control operations are heavily influenced by private control organizations like Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids and the Union, whose international lobbying and policy work is funded by Michael Bloomberg, an American billionaire and former New York City mayor. Scumbag liar! Interesting how a lot of these politicians end up becoming billionaires and millionaires on the taxpayers' money. Now that's funny. While they're screwing you are making all kinds of cash. I don't want to answer the question. Bloomberg is the largest private funder of anti-tobacco efforts in the world, and his money clears a path for the prohibitionist policy demands that inevitably follow. All of Bloomberg-funded tobacco control and public health organizations advocate for bans and restrictions on vaping especially in low- and middle-income countries. In 2016, Bloomberg was named the World Health Organization's Global Ambassador for Non-Communicable Diseases and Injuries, an honorary position that reflects the World Health Organization's alignment with the moralistic mayor. I just want them to suffer. Oh, I'll have to remember that one. Good job, Jim. You just got me a new campaign slogan. The moralistic mayor. You know, you're really beautiful. Mm Mm-hmm. Doesn't take much to get me excited, does it? Nope. Well, when you constantly read all the bad news that's out there. Glory! And you see how little is being done about it. And how few people advocate for it. Aww. Doesn't take much to be excited. Congratulations. I'll let you read the rest of the article. Very well written. Jim always writes a good article. And he keeps on top of most of the stuff that's out there. At least what he has the uh, time and energy to be able to keep up with, because it's never ending. Aww. How about it's time somebody talks about the fact that, okay, 
This is not a new idea. Banning stuff and prohibitionist agendas don't work. We've already talked about how prohibition of alcohol didn't work. It just created a thriving black market and how the same thing's going to happen if vaping is banned and prohibited. Well, there's already places around the world where that's happened. Aww. Right? So, theoretically, you should be able to look at that country and go, well, did it really work? Did it stop people from doing things that, you know, you wanted to make sure that they didn't do? Hasta la vista, baby. Well, you already know the answer to this one. And here we have a beautiful article titled, Electronic Cigarettes Ban May Not Change Hong Kong Teens Vaping Habits, says local youth support group. Local group believes young people might find other ways to get their hands on the products. Well, surprise, surprise! Wow. Huh? Yeah. That's the exact same thing that I've been pounding into the news every single week. Big surprise! Nope. Local group believes young people might find other ways to get their hands on the products. Amazing. The truth being spoken for all to read. How many people are going to actually read this? Game over, man. It's game over. For teen vapors, implementing the ban on electronic cigarettes may not change their vaping habits, a youth support group said. Last Wednesday, a bill to amend the smoking ordinance targeting new tobacco products was submitted to the Legislative Council. The bill covers anyone who brings in imports, makes, sells, distributes, or promotes alternative smoking products such as electronic cigarettes, heat and burn products, and herbal cigarettes. Mm. Oh, this is grand time! This is a new term being pushed by Bloomberg, alternative smoking products, next generation products. Nutty is a fruitcake. I've been seeing a lot of that lately, and it wasn't in the previous articles I was uh, I covered. Nope. Why a blanket ban on vaping electronic cigarettes is bad news for Hong Kong teenagers. Whoops. Well, the maximum penalty is six months in jail and the Hong Kong fifty thousand dollar fine. Well, that's pretty severe. Did it stop the people that? We're going out and buying marijuana before it was legalized in New York from going out and buying it? Nope. We're growing it? Nope. We're smoking it? Nope. I don't think so. Nope. But a lot of people went to jail. And the prison industrial complex made a lot of money. Whoops. Well, on people that were breaking the law. Special delivery. We're running out of time. Take a look at the rest of the article yourself if you're interested. Pretty interesting. Shut up, dummy. We're running out of time. Covers the same basic ideology. Shut the hell up. It doesn't work. Prohibition doesn't work. Never has worked. Never will work. Nope. Moving on. Here we have a study. Something to change pace, change gears. Downshift a little bit and cover something that uh, some people that are now forced to do into DIY e-liquid are wondering, you know, what flavorings have been tested as being safe for vaping? You don't know what commercial manufacturers have been using. The scientific studies that were submitted to the PMTA process and application process, well, some of that is trade secrets, even though the science was done. Well, for some of them, the science was done as a group. It'd be nice if that science was made available to the public as part of the application process. Oh, yeah. But here we have an actual scientific study done by Relics Technology. And it was published in the Journal of Applied Toxicology showing the cooling agent WS-23, widely used in electronic cigarettes, has limited impact on experimental animals at the tested dose. Take a look at the article yourself if you're interested to find out more about how Relics tested WS-23, the synthetic cooling agent that was used in food and medicine and tobacco prior to being utilized in electronic cigarettes. But since 
toxicology, inhalation toxicology for electronic cigarettes is important because it does impact your health. It's nice to know that these products are being continually tested. And I imagine Relix was doing some of these tests for the United States market to apply for PMTA to get marketing approval in the United States. But it's nice to know that the science is there once again showing that this is a safe product and we will not harm you. Let's move on. Along the same lines, if any of you that are watching this program have a postdoctoral status and you're a researcher with expertise in analytical chemistry and you happen to be a vapor, well, I'm here to tell you that the University of California is looking for you and they want to give you $53,000 a year if you go work for them and be one of their researchers because they want to find out what the chemistry of vaping aerosol is. How much of it's there, what's there, what the percentages, concentrations are. So, there'll be a link in the description below. I thought this is curious. Wonder if this is, uh, you know, somebody that's gonna be the new drum, like Stanton Glantz was. Or is this going to be somebody that's gonna do real science? that is reputable, repeatable, and accepted by other universities and schools. Interesting. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. There'll be a link in the description below. It's interesting how they're going to give preferential treatment for applications that are received by November 8th, 2020. <laughs> even though this was just published yesterday. Whoops. Applications are due by 6-1-2021. Fantastic. Moving on to our last article. I'm just so out of it today because I got so worked up in the beginning. and It was because of things like this that I keep coming across. It's hard to find good news when it comes to vaping. It's not that there isn't good news out there. There are scientific studies done all the time that show how good vaping is and whatnot. Well, here we have the National Institutes of Health that funded this new study that says most U.S. adults who vape want to quit. Mm-hmm. So 60% of U.S. adults who vape are interested in quitting. This is a fake. I don't think this According is real. According to the study published today in the Journal of American Medical Association, Network Open, by MUSC Hollings Cancer Center researchers. I'm not really sure, man. Uh-huh. 60% of people want to quit the 95% safer product. Interesting. Uh, Anti-vaping propaganda is brain poison. Yeah, it really is. According to the findings, former cigarette smokers had the highest intentions and interested in quitting this is likely due to an increased number of smokers using electronic cigarettes to transition away from cigarettes, said the study's author. While evidence has shown that switching to electronic cigarettes can be as effective as medication-based treatments for smoking cessation in some cases, many people continue to vape even after they've quit smoking. Those who aren't able to stop smoking often end up using both cigarettes and e-cigarettes simultaneously, increasing potential risks to their health. Oh, yeah? How about you show me that study? I don't believe you. Nope. Hmm? Nope. The research that I've seen states that people start vaping to give up their deadly combustible habit. And for some people, it takes a while where they're dual users. But it's kind of like eating healthy. It's about adding in the healthy thing and you squeeze out the opportunity for the unhealthy thing. So if you're always eating junk food and not eating healthy meals, you can't expect to just start a diet one day that's healthy 
and be able to stick to it. So the best way for you to become healthy, well, that's for you to start picking up healthy behaviors. Start adding healthy fruits and vegetables and nuts and legumes into your diet. And the more of that that you have, well, the less room you're going to have for the unhealthy options. Well, surprise, surprise, huh? Tobacco harm reduction works exactly the same way. You start vaping to quit smoking, and you just keep vaping more and more and more, and eventually you won't have time or interest in lighting up and burning tobacco. It's common sense. <laughs> But according to her, it's the other way around. People quit smoking with a vape, and then they decide, well, that's not enough. I, I want to smoke and vape. Okay. That's not what I find. I'd like to know the study that you found that says that. <coughs> the rest of the article goes on to beat and bash vaping is, well, it just doesn't work. Does she want to become the new Stanton Glantz? Because a lot of the stuff that's in here isn't written from a neutral scientific perspective. This is written from a preaching perspective. It says, smoking cessation is best achieved through a combination of medication and behavioral counseling. It helps people to break the habit with coping skills and substituted behaviors. That sounds good, but you need to first accept that this is the substituted behavior. Some people dream of success while you're going to wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. And it has nothing to do with nicotine. Because I've given up nicotine. And then I've gone back to using nicotine. And then I gave it up. And some of my vapes have nothing in them. And some of them have nicotine in them. Yeah, you're right. I definitely do it. And sometimes I go for weeks on end with zero milligram and don't have a problem with it until people like her get me all worked up and make me want to have a cigarette. And then as soon as that happens, guess what I do? Oh, I go and I grab something that has some nicotine in it, mellows me out, calms me down. It's amazing. Tobacco harm reduction. Some people don't want to, and some people just can't quit. They need that to cope because it is their coping mechanism. And as long as it doesn't harm, harm them, and as long as it is safer than combustible tobacco, there's no reason anybody out there should try to prevent you from having access to the safer nicotine products. All right, one more thing that I wanted to cover today that I've kind of gotten away from, not because I ran out of things, but because I usually run out of time before I get a chance to cover everything. But because of my funky mood and uh, my irritation with some of the stuff I've come across today and whatnot, I seem to always seem to not have enough time to show you the advocacy groups out there that are fighting for your rights. And earlier we talked about an author, Lindsey Stroud. Well, let me show you a website where she has been documenting tobacco harm reduction and fundamentally boils it down to a 101 level website. So anybody that truly wants to learn what is tobacco harm reduction, how does it work and what the truths of vaping are, the truths of tobacco harm reduction. Well, you got to check out thr101.org. Lindsay Stroud has got it boiled down so you can literally look up. Give me a second. You can literally look up every single state and pick a state 
any state. You can look at the map and pick any state you want. Like we were talking about Parma, Ohio earlier. Well, what does Ohio think of tobacco harm reduction? And what taxes do they have in place? Well, she's got to boil down. I mean, this is like a dummy's guide for tobacco harm reduction. In Ohio, excise taxes, $1.60 per pack of cigarettes. Other tobacco products are 17% of the wholesale price. Little cigars are 37% of the wholesale price. Premium cigars are 50 cents per cigar. And e-cigarettes are 10 cents per milliliter. Uh-huh. You can look up any state in the United States. And she has Tobacco Harm Reduction 101 little cue cards that you can actually take a look at if you want to know anything about tobacco harm reduction in that area. It shows during 2016 and 2017, only 1.38% of Ohio high school students used an electronic cigarette on a daily basis. Uh-huh. Not this 25% that they keep shoving down people's throats. It's interesting. Nick talked about the other day on the news about how they tried to do a study. And the study was, the aim of the study was, is to get these addicted kids to give up their electronic cigarette habit, right? They couldn't find enough kids to make a valid study. There weren't enough of them. Well, considering if you take a look in the UK and you take a look at what the actual data shows, it's only 1.38%. The data figures, when you see large figures like 25% or 20% or 30%, those are inflated numbers because they are flipping the data points to make it sound bigger than what it really is. Only 1.3% of Ohio high school students reported using electronic cigarettes daily. Only 1% of FDA retail compliance checks in Ohio resulted in sales, illegal sales to minors. Ohio spends very little on tobacco prevention. In 2019, Ohio dedicated only $13 million to tobacco control, or basically 1%, 1% of what the state gets from the master settlement agreement, tobacco money, the taxes, the federal taxes, 1%. 1% is all they get to spend out of all this money. 99% of it is spent elsewhere in the state. And Ohio's not alone. Let's go back to the state. Let's take a look at California. How does California fare when it comes to tobacco harm reduction? Well, California's vaping industry provided more than $2.9 billion in economic activity in 2018 while generating 2,905 vaping-related jobs. Sales of disposables and pre-filled cartridges in California exceed $9.9 million in 2016, and I'm sure there are a lot more, and it could be potentially exponentially more if they approach tobacco harm reduction as a way for smokers to give up their deadly combustible habit. It's amazing. In 2018, 10.9% of high school students reported past 30-day use of vaping devices, but only 1.9% reported daily use. Where is the epidemic they're talking about? Oh, that's right, because vapor devices are not as addicting as tobacco, combustible tobacco is. Kids can try a vape, and if... They're not allowed to vape? Well, guess what happens? They'll go try something else. Because it's not as addictive as combustible tobacco. Common sense. 
Well, for some of us. California, once again, spends very little on tobacco prevention. In 2019, California dedicated only $250.4 million of tobacco control money, or roughly 8% of what the state received in tobacco settlement payments and taxes. 92% of the master settlement agreement payments to the state are being spent elsewhere on other things. The master settlement agreement was put there for the purposes of educating and offsetting the harms caused by combustible tobacco. But states are not spending the money there for it. Matter of fact, a lot of these states figured, oh, we're going to get, let's just say arbitrarily, $2 billion dollars in master settlement agreement money. But rather than waiting for the money to actually come into the state coffers, well, we want to build this bridge. Well, let's just use tobacco money to finance it. So we'll put a bond out on it. And now a lot of these states are panicking because, well, cigarette sales are down. And we don't have enough tax money to pay the bonds when they're coming due. Let alone what happened with COVID. Big surprise. But I highly recommend, if you're interested in learning about tobacco harm reduction in your state where you live, take a look at this website, tobaccoharmreduction101.org, thr101.org. And you can take a look up any state. You can also take a look up at research, all the research, all the legislation. It's amazing. I'm not alone when it comes to passionately advocating for tobacco harm reduction. And it is very nice to see somebody that is able to curate a website as nice as this. I'm just, I'm amazed. It is a beautiful website. You wanna look at research? Here's a list of all the research. Here's key points. It's amazing. State Tobacco 21 laws failed to reduce youth vaping. Vaping up, smoking increases among San Francisco teens despite the bans. Uh-huh. Take a look at the website. Amazing advocacy website. I don't have time to say this gently, so I'll be very direct. We're running out of time. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up the news for the 2nd of April. 2021. I want to thank you guys for watching. I sincerely hope all of you have a wonderful weekend and I'll catch you next week, hopefully in a better mood with some better news. All right, that's it for today.